guys, it's Miss Simpson. It's time for reading today. Today, my main focus while we read our chapter is going to be author's purpose. Now, you are going to actually practice some author's purpose today using some task cards. So um, make sure you're paying attention. So there are um, five different reasons that authors write books, novels, magazine articles, billboard ads. There, I mean, there are reasons that people do things. So sometimes authors are trying to persuade you of something. Did they, did they try to convince you to believe something? I don't know if you guys have ever read the book, I Wanna Iguana. I Wanna Iguana is a persuasive book. The little character in the book is trying to persuade his mom to buy him an iguana. Now, we also see persuasive in billboards and we see persuasive in magazines. They want you to buy that big old juicy hamburger from Whataburger or Burger King on the billboard. And so they're trying to persuade you to buy it. There's also in form. This is mainly nonfiction. Did the author give you facts or new information on a topic? Are they giving you facts on, let's say, uh, I always use the example of frogs, but that's the one I always use. Um, there's, I have a ton of books on space and astronauts and dinosaurs. Those are all informational books. They're giving you new info. Are they entertaining you? Are they telling you a story for the reader to enjoy? Now, this kind of, um, this is normally fiction. So when you have a fiction book, not all of the time, but a good chunk of the time is going to be entertaining you. We have explain. Is the author trying to teach the reader something, like a recipe? Are they trying to tell you to do something, like directions to a house? And finally, we have describe. Are they using sensory details to show you how something looked, smelled, sounded, felt, or tasted, like the the hot, steamy brownies came out of the oven and permeated the room with the smell of chocolate and caramel? That would be a very descriptive sentence. So the biggest thing that we focus on here is we are trying to figure out the genre of a book. That's the first thing that we do when we're determining author's purpose. And then when we figure out what the genre of the book is, then it's much easier to figure out why the author wrote that book. So for example, Gregor the Overlander. What is the genre of this book? I've told you a million bazillion times. This is fiction, yes. What kind of fiction? This is fantasy because it couldn't happen in real life. It could not happen. It's not realistic fiction. This is fake. It's fantasy. So when we have realistic fiction or if we have fantasy, there really are only a certain amount of reasons that authors could have written the book. They're not really persuading me to do something. It's not nonfiction. I'm not being given directions and it's not describing one thing to me. So it's got to be entertaining. It has to be entertaining. It's telling me a story for my enjoyment. So you can narrow it down and you can narrow author's purpose down just by figuring out the genre. So let's say you're reading a passage or on your task cards down below, you're reading them and you're thinking to yourself the whole time, is this fiction or nonfiction? If it's fiction, it's going to be persuade or entertain. If it's nonfiction, most of the time it's inform, explain, or describe. So it narrows down you to two or three options once you figure out the genre. So the author's purpose of the book, if you can figure out what that is first without the genre, sometimes it'll help you figure out what the genre is. So Let's say that you're like, oh, this is definitely entertaining. Well, guess what? Entertaining is only fiction. So you would know that that book is fiction. But I want you to try to figure out today while you're doing your assignment, the genre first, fiction or nonfiction. That's the main two that we're focusing on. And then once you have fiction or nonfiction, then I want you to figure out what would be the author's purpose. Remember, P and E, these two are fiction, and inform, explain, and describe are nonfiction. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. We are going to read chapter seven of Gregor the Overlander today. We just finished chapter six on Friday, and what happened was he was hearing the story of how they came to the Underland, and he was in the palace. They were about to feed him. Uh, but he was hearing the story of how everybody came to the Underland and he found out that the person that found the Underland and brought a whole bunch of people there died because he didn't have enough sunlight. So immediately Gregor was like, I have got to get out of here. 
Okay, so we are going to read chapter seven today. Does anybody have any predictions about what's going to happen? I want you to pause the video and make some predictions. Does anybody have any questions about what's happened so far? Pause the video and ask yourself some questions. Today, while I'm reading, I want you to be thinking about the genre. How is this fiction? How is it fantasy? And how do you know that the author's purpose, the reason that they wrote this book is to entertain you? Get back it up with some evidence. They are entertaining you by what? What are they doing? All right. I'm also going to stop and I'm going to have you visualize today in your brain about what's going on in the book. So are you ready? All right. The darkness pressed down on Gregor's eyes until he felt it had physical weight like water. He'd never been completely without light before. At home, street lights, car headlights, and the occasional flashing fire truck shone in the tiny window of his bedroom. Here, once he'd blown out the oil lamp, it was as if he'd lost the sense of sight entirely. He'd been tempted to relight the lamp. Meredith had told him that torches burned all night long in the corridor outside his room, and he could rekindle the flame there. But he wanted to save the oil. He'd be lost without it once he got out of Regalia. So, sounds like he's still planning on escaping. Boots made a snuffling sound and pressed her back deeper into his side. His arms tightened around her. Servants had prepared be separate beds for them, but Boots had climbed right in with Gregor. It hadn't been hard to get the Underlanders to excuse them for bed. Everyone could see Boots could barely keep her eyes open, and he must have looked pretty ragged himself. He wasn't. Adrenaline was pumping through him so fast, he was afraid that people could hear his heart beating through the heavy curtains that shut off their bedroom from the hall. The last thing he could do was sleep. They had been invited to bathe again before bed. It was something of a necessity for Boots, who, in addition to Stu, had conditioned her curls with some kind of pudding. Gregor hadn't objected either. The water gave him a quiet place to think about his escape plan. It also gave him a chance to ask Dulcet about the water system in the palace without seeming suspicious. How do you guys have hot and cold running water? He asked. She told him the water was pumped from a series of hot and cold springs. And then it just empties back into a spring? He asked innocently. Oh, no, that would not be fresh, said Dulcet. The dirty water falls into the river beneath the palace and then flows to the waterway. It was just the information he needed. The river beneath the palace was their way out. Even better, it led to the waterway. He didn't know what that, that was exactly, but Vicus had mentioned it had two gateways to the overland. Boots stirred again in her sleep, and Gregor patted her side to quiet her. She had not seemed to miss home until bedtime, but she looked worried when he told her it was time to go to sleep. Mama, she asked. Lizzie? Was it only that morning that Lizzie had ridden off to camp on the bus? It seemed like a thousand years ago. Home? Mama, Boots insisted. Even though she was exhausted, he had a hard time getting her to sleep. Now he could tell by how restless she was that she was having vivid dreams. Probably full of giant cockroaches and bats he thought. He had no way to tell how much time had passed. An hour or two, well, what little noise he'd been able to hear through the curtain had ceased. He was going to do this thing. He needed to get started. Gregor gently disengaged himself from Boots and stood up. He fumbled in the dark and followed or found the sling Dulcet had given him. Trying to position Boots inside, it proved trickly. Finally, he just squeezed his eyes shut and let his other senses work. That was easier. He slid her in and slung the pack on his back. Boots murmured, Mama, and her head fell against his shoulder. I'm working on it, baby, he whispered back and searched the table for the lamp. That was all he was taking. Boots, the pack, and the lamp. He'd need his hands for other things. Gregor groped his way to the curtain and pushed the edge aside. There was enough torchlight for, from the far hall for him to make out the passage was empty. The Underlanders had not bothered to post guards at his doors now that they knew him better. They were making an effort to make him feel like a guest, and anyway, where would he go? Down the river, he thought grimly, wherever that leads. He crept along the hall, taking care of care to place each of his bare feet silently. Thankfully, Boots slept on. His plan would disintegrate if she woke before he got out of the palace. Their bedroom was conveniently close to the bathroom, and Gregor followed his way to the watery sound. His plan was simple. The river ran under the palace. If he could make his way to the ground floor without losing the sound of water, he should find the place it drained into the river. If the plan was simple, its execution was not. It took Gregor several hours to weave his way down through the palace. The bathrooms were not always near the stairs, and he found himself having to backtrack so he wouldn't lose the sound of rushing water. Twice he had to duck into rooms and hide when he spotted underlanders. There weren't many about, but some sort of guards patrolled the palace at night. 
Finally, the sound of water became stronger and he made his way to the lowest level of the building. He followed his ears to where the roar was loudest and sneaked through a doorway. For a moment, Gregor almost abandoned his plan when Dulcet had said river. He would pictured the rivers that flowed through New York City, but this Underland River looked like something out of an action adventure movie. It wasn't terribly wide, but it ran with such speed that the surface was churned into white foam. He couldn't guess its depth, but had enough power to carry large boulders by as if they were empty soda cans. No wonder the Underlanders didn't bother to post a guard on the dock. The river was more dangerous than any army they could assemble, but you must be able to travel on it. They have boats, thought Gregor, noticing half a dozen crafts tied up above the rush of the current. They were made out of some kind of skin stretched over a frame. They reminded him of the canoes at camp. Camp? Why couldn't he just be at camp like a normal kid? Trying not to think of the bobbing, bobbing boulders, he lit his oil lamp from a torch by the dock. On reflection, he took the torch as well. Where he was going, light would be as important as air. He blew out the oil lamp to save fuel. He carefully climbed into one of the boats and checked it out. The torch slid into a holder clearly designed for it. How do you get this thing down in the water? He wondered. Two ropes held it aloft. They were attached to a metal wheel that was affixed to the dock. Well, here goes nothing, Gregor said, and gave the wheel a yank. He gave a loud creak and the boat fell straight into the river, knocking Gregor on his rear end. The current swept up the boat like it was a dried leaf. Gregor gasped, grasped the sides, and hung on as they shot into the darkness. Hearing voices, he managed to look back at the dock for a moment. Two underlanders were screaming something after him. The river curved, and they vanished from sight. Would they come after him? Of course they'd come after him. But he had, he had a head start. How far was it to the waterway? What was the waterway? And once he got there, where did he go next? Gregor would have been more concerned about these questions if he wasn't trying so hard to stay alive. Along with the boulders, he had to dodge the jagged black rocks that jutted out of the water. He found an oar lying along the bottom of the boat and used it to deflect the canoe off the rocks. Okay, I'm going to pause right there real quick. I know we have about a page left. I want you right now to pause the video and I want you to visualize what is happening so far. And then I'm going to tell you what I'm picturing. So pause the video and visualize what's happening so far. Okay, so you should have paused. Here's what I'm picturing. He gets to the very bottom of the palace, topsy-turvy, and he's standing in the bottom staring at the waterway. And it looks like I don't know if you've ever been white water rafting or ever seen white water rafting, but that's what I'm picturing the river looking like. And him having a sleep toddler on his back. And I picture him just, excuse me, staring out, staring out, looking at all of the white water. And he's like, you know what? I got to do it. And I see him in the boat, boots on his back. She's asleep. The white water just taking him away and two people in the background screaming. Ah! <laughs> I see like rocks jutting now and black rocks. And I see both Boots and him getting very scared, scared faces. All right, let's keep reading. The temperature of the underland had felt comfortably cool since he'd arrived, especially after the 90 degree, 90 degree heat of his apartment. But the cold wind whipping up off the water made goosebumps rise on his flesh. Gregor, he thought he'd heard someone call his name. Was it his imagination or no? And there it was again. The underlanders must be closing in on him. The river swerved and suddenly he could see a little better. A long cavern lined with crystal shimmers around him, reflecting back his torchlight. Gregor made out a glittering beach flanking one side of the river up ahead. A tunnel led from the beach into the dark. On impulse, Gregor pushed off of a rock and pointed the canoe toward the beach. He paddled desperately with the oar for the shore. Staying on the river was no use. The underlanders were breathing down his neck. Maybe he had time to pull up on the beach and hide in the tunnel. After they'd passed by, he could wait a few hours and try the river again. The canoe slammed into the beach. Gregor caught himself just before his face hit the bo boat bottom. Boots jerked, partly awake, and cried a little, but he soothed her back to sleep with his voice as he struggled to pull his craft across the sand with one hand while carrying the torch with the other. It's okay, Boots. Shh, go back to sleep. Hi, Bat, she murmured, and her head plopped back onto his shoulder. Gregor heard his name in the distance and sped up. He had just reached the mouth of the tunnel when he ran headfirst into something warm and furry.
Startled, he staggered back a few paces, dropping the torch. Then something stepped out into the dim light and Gregor's knees turned to jelly and he sunk down slowly to the sand. The face of a monstrous rat broke into a smile. <gasps> oh my goodness. He just bumped into a giant rat. Ah! All right. So what in the world in this chapter has made you think so far that this book, the author's purpose is to entertain? Well, there's a plot, right? There's a plot. There's stories and characters and events and the setting. There's a plot. Now, another thing is there's fictional characters in this book. So I think they're trying to enjoy. They're trying to make us enjoy it with these fictional characters. All right. So you are going to complete the task cards right down below. They're author's purpose task cards. There's not that many of them. I want you on there to answer the questions, write what the author's purpose is. And remember, read it through. If it is fiction, it's either persuade or entertain. If it's nonfiction, it's inform, explain, or describe. All right, guys. I love you all so much. Have a great day.